get the recording started. We are in session number seven. Believe it or not, seven sessions into the New Testament survey. And we'll be finishing up the Gospel of Matthew today. Uh, Matthew uh, is the, uh, the first gospel that was written, I believe. Uh, I'm in a minority there. A lot of, uh, a lot of scholars think that uh, Matthew was uh, copied from Mark, but I don't think so. Uh, I, I think they were all looking at the same stuff. I think Matthew comes earliest, and he lays down the, uh, the basic layout. By the time we get to chapter 26, which is where we are today, uh, we're into the last events in the life of Christ. Uh, here we're going to see uh, the, the betrayal, uh, the trials, the crucifixion, and then the resurrection and the post-resurrection appearances of Christ. Uh, Matthew uh, lays out enough detail that uh, we can check his reports against the other Gospels. Uh, we can use his, uh, his time sequence to give us a basic structure of uh, all that's going on during uh, this time. Uh, the, uh, the details that, uh, that Luke provides, or that Matthew provides, uh, line up very nicely with everything that we know about the history of the period. Uh, so people like uh, Pontius Pilate, for example, um, are real historical characters. They, they lived and worked at about the, the time that, uh, uh, that the Bible says they did. Uh, the, uh, the historical nature of the gospels is what gives them authority. Uh, these are not uh, once upon a time, just so stories. Uh, this, is, uh, this is meant to be understood as history. So what we see in chapters 26, and 27 is the, the final story of the rejection of Christ. And we're going to uh, go ahead and um, share the screen. Let me see if I can find my cursor. There are tis. We'll share the screen and uh, uh, go from there. Okay, here we go. Uh, the uh, story of uh, the rejection of Christ by the uh, the Jewish authorities uh, is uh, actually really important. Uh, and there's a, a lot going on here. Uh, the uh, The story uh, starts out in uh, uh, chapter uh, twenty six uh, with uh, the uh, uh, plot to kill Jesus. Uh, this this has uh, happened um, prior to this time, but uh, we're we're getting into the uh, the final stages. Judas has been plotting this the whole time. Uh, in uh, chapter uh, 24, 25, we've got the uh, the Olivet discourse, which is a lot of prophetic stuff, uh, fairly important for understanding the structure of biblical prophecy. It fills in some blanks uh, that. Uh, are still left from uh, the book of Daniel, uh, and it's stuff that will be expanded even further by the book of Revelation. And now Jesus comes off of uh, uh, off of the uh, Mount of Olives. He's uh, uh, getting ready for the last act. When Jesus had finished these sayings, he said to his disciples, "You know that after two days the Passover is coming." So uh, this has to have been. A, uh, uh, a uh, Wednesday or Thursday evening. Passover uh, is uh, probably going to be on a Saturday. Uh, and uh, that would put, it depends on how you're counting the days, uh, but we typically take this as to be a Thursday night. Uh, and we're we're going to be moving very quickly now toward uh, the end of uh, end of the week. The Son of Man is going to be delivered up and be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders and the people gathered in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas. 
and they plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and to kill him. And they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. <laughs> because they knew that Jesus is very popular. Uh, sometimes uh, politicians are like this. Uh, when they, they realize that they can't uh, win their argument uh, by uh, legal means, uh, they choose to do it another way. Uh, and that's what we've got uh, Caiaphas and the chief priests doing. They can't influence the people because of their own uh, goodness and uh, uh, <laughs> great leadership and all of the rest. So they're going to cheat. You know, they're going to kill Jesus, uh, thinking that somehow that's going to make the problem better. It doesn't. It makes their problem worse. Uh, what we're going to see is the collapse of the whole Jewish state. Uh, so the uh, uh, the high priests are, are getting together, and there, Judas has already decided he's going to uh, betray Jesus. So we see Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper. Uh, now that's interesting. It seems like Jesus has got a lot of friends in uh, Bethany. Simon the leper is probably the uh, same leper who was healed uh, sometime earlier. Uh, and a woman came to him with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment. She pointed on, on his head at the table. The disciples saw it and they were indignant saying, why this waste? This could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. Uh, uh, but uh, Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why do you trouble the woman? She has done a beautiful thing. For you will always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. Now, this is not to say that we shouldn't do nice things for the poor when we have opportunities. Uh, it is to say that uh, the believer's devotion to Christ needs to come first. All the rest will, will come. Uh, there will be tomorrow to help the poor. Uh, but our time with Christ is special. Uh, and uh, what this woman did uh, was an anticipation of the anointing that would take place for burial. Really quite a, quite a good thing. Uh, elsewhere, we're told that it was nard, which is a kind of uh, very expensive ointment. Uh, and, and I don't know a whole lot about it, but it's, uh, it's an expensive stuff. Uh, she has done this to prepare me for burial, verse 12. Truly, I say, uh, wherever this gospel is proclaimed to the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. So there it is. I've told the story. Uh, and this was a great thing that uh, this woman did. It probably cost her quite a bit. Uh, there's some tradition that this, uh, uh, this particular woman who uh, did the anointing uh, may have been Mary Magdalene, uh, and that's possible. Um, Matthew doesn't say. I've forgotten if the other Gospels uh, give a, uh, an identification, but I'll, I'll notice that when we get there. And immediately afterwards, uh, one of the 12, whose name was Judas, went to the chief priests and said, what will you give me if I deliver him? Now, Judas was the, the one who uh, took care of the cash bag. Uh, Jesus and his disciples had a little petty cash, a uh, few pieces of silver to uh, pay for food and whatnot. Uh, it wasn't much, but Judas was in charge of that. Uh, and uh, Some have said that Judas is probably the one that complained about uh, the, uh, uh, the use of expensive ointment. Uh, and that's entirely possible. I, I rather think that uh, Judas would have done a thing like that. And so they paid him 30 pieces of silver. Now notice it's 30 pieces of silver, not 30 pieces of gold. Uh, a, a piece of silver would have been a fairly small coin. Uh, 30 pieces of silver is not a lot of money. Uh, it's, it's a substantial amount of money. It's approximately uh, the value of a slave in those days. Uh, so it's uh, uh, it's not nothing, but it's not a vast fortune either. Uh, it's, um, 
a fairly small price. And from that moment on, he sought the opportunity. And so there, here we have the Passover coming up. On the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, go into the city with a certain man, say, uh, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I'll keep the Passover at your house. And the disciples uh, did as Jesus had directed them and they prepared the Passover. Uh, the traditional location of the Passover uh, is uh, a room on uh, Mount Zion in uh, Jerusalem, not too far from the Dormition Abbey. There's a whole bunch of stuff that is concentrated in that one little area. The Tomb of David is there. Uh, the uh, the Muslims have a uh, have a mosque that is the very place where uh, Muhammad. Uh, rested on his way up to the Temple Mount in his vision in the night. Uh, the Roman Catholics uh, built, the, uh, uh, built a cathedral up there, uh, uh, marking the very spot where uh, Mary uh, uh, lay sound asleep while she was awaiting her uh, ascension into heaven. You know, all, all of the, you know, whatever. Uh, the the upper room is uh, uh, in the second story of a building that has David's tomb downstairs uh, uh, and is right next door to the mosque. Uh, and, you know, it, it's uh, the room itself uh, is uh, medieval Gothic architecture. It was built by the Crusaders. Uh, and the Crusaders had no clue whatsoever that uh, this was the right or wrong place. Uh, but ever since that time, it's been pointed out as the upper room. Uh, I'm, I'm not providing a photograph of that uh, because frankly, it isn't the right place. It can't be the right place. There's no chance it's the right place. Uh, sometimes uh, these things are funny, but anyway, uh, there was an upper room and uh, oh, in uh, the Gospel of John, we're going to work very carefully through a thing called the upper room discourse. A lot of things that Jesus uh, taught his disciples uh, during that uh, Passover uh, meal, that very, very important uh, event. At any rate, we've got the story told here. So they, uh, uh, they came together when it was evening, uh, verse 20. He reclined at table with the 12 as they were eating. He said, truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. Now this, by the way, is the, uh, uh, the very moment that is uh, captured uh, by Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper. Uh, and uh, that's in a church in Italy somewhere. I've forgotten where that is. I, I can't remember where that is. Uh, somebody there probably has seen that. Uh, do you know which one I'm talking about? Uh, what has always bothered me about uh, the, uh, the painting of the Last Supper uh, is that all of the disciples and Jesus are sitting on one side of the table. You know, at a real table, it's a kind of a U-shaped uh, table, and uh, it's very short. Uh, and you, uh, uh, you recline at table. We're told here that they reclined at table. Uh, and uh, that means you're up on one elbow and you're, uh, you've got your feet usually under the table. Uh, in a classical Roman dining room, it's called a triclinium. And there's room under the table. It's kind of a dugout under the table. And you can put your feet there. Uh, and you, you sit on, a, on couches all around the table. And the servants uh, come into the open end of the U and uh, provide all of the, uh, the stuff that is um, uh, at need. Uh, that's the kind of a dining room that we're probably talking about here. Uh, it doesn't say that there were servants. Uh, and uh, uh, the, 
uh, impression we get is that the disciples took care of themselves. Uh, this is where Jesus is going to wash the feet. That's where he's going to teach. A lot of things are happening. So truly, I say, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful. And they began to say to, to him and after each other, Lord, is it I? And he answered, he who uh, dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. Uh, and he's, he's talking about dipping uh, your hand in the dish is, is the way you got some food. Uh, if uh, uh, it's it different from uh, our our modern tables, uh, we we have uh, different bits of food and different bowls, and you pass it around, and you use a spoon to get something out and put it on your plate. In the ancient world, uh, the uh, the bread was the uh, was the main thing, and you would take some bread. What we call it pita, uh, and take the bread and dip it into a bowl of, uh, uh, of whatever was going to be eaten. It could be a sauce, it could be meat, it could be whatever. This would be lamb uh, and uh, reach in and uh, scoop out what you're going to eat. Uh, so you use the bread instead of a fork or a spoon. So Judas had probably just dipped his bread into the uh, into the meat to get something to eat uh, and uh, Jesus said you're the one uh, and the son of man goes as it is written but woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed it would have been better for that man if he'd never been born and Judas who would betray him answered rabbi is it I and he said to him you have said so Jesus knew just what was going on. Uh, at uh, this point, we see the institution of the Lord's Supper. Uh, the Lord uh, uh, Jesus took bread while they were eating. Uh, and after he blessed it, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, said, take, eat, this is my body. He took a cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink it all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Okay, that's a, uh, that's a passage that we often read uh, during the communion service. This is what Jesus was setting up. He's uh, saying, you're, you're doing this uh, as a way of remembering uh, Christ on the cross. That's the Last Supper. So I tell you, I won't drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day I drink it with you all in my Father's kingdom. So there's something very important here going on. Uh, and uh, here, uh, it has to do with the definition of terms again, uh, with the, uh, the whole idea of the kingdom. Jesus is on earth with his disciples in Jerusalem, sharing the Last Supper, uh, he's eating the bread and drinking the wine, saying, I'm not going to do this with you again until we share this supper in my father's kingdom. He's looking forward to another personal face-to-face -face meeting with his disciples. Uh, now, clearly, all of his disciples uh, have died and gone to heaven. So the fulfillment of that promise is not the disciples meeting Jesus in heaven. Also, the fulfillment of this is not in the church. So when we as the church uh, celebrate the Lord's Supper together, Jesus is present spiritually, but not physically. Uh, the, uh, the time is coming when Jesus will be actually present in Jerusalem on the earth physically with his people and will at that time share the Lord's Supper in person. Uh, and uh, that's, that's a kind of an amazing thing. Uh, uh, it, it says, I'm going to do it with you, uh, by which he means his disciples. Uh, and I don't know how that's going to work out, but I, uh, the, the promise is yet future. This is uh, the fulfillment of the kingdom 
promises. Uh, this is a part of what we mean by already, not yet. So the, the kingdom does in fact exist because Jesus is the king, the kingdom of God is eternal, the kingdom of heaven exists in the person of the king, but there is a not yet component to the kingdom because Jesus still intends to return. He still intends to pass judgment on the earth. He still intends to set up a thousand year peaceful kingdom on the earth and then eternity will begin. So there is quite a bit of future that still awaits fulfillment. Uh, and uh, here in the Last Supper, Jesus looks forward to that. Uh, in uh, verses 30 and beyond, Jesus foretells Peter's denial. Uh, then off they go to, before the, uh, this very night is over with, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter says, oh, no, I'll go to the death. <laughs> sure you will, Pete. <laughs> Yeah, we love you, Pete, but it's, uh, it's not going to work that way. We go on to Gethsemane. I'm going to show you some pictures uh, before we go uh, too much further, because I want to show you the, uh, uh, the Garden of Gethsemane. The photograph in the background here is uh, shot uh, from the Garden of Gethsemane, and you can see the Eastern Gate off in the background. Let's see if I can get some Jerusalem pictures here. Okay, where's my, come on. Oops, there we go, Jerusalem shots. Okay, this is, uh, this is Jerusalem. Uh, this kind of a random Jerusalem shot. This is actually Mount Zion. Uh, if you can see my cursor here, I'll show you. This is the Dormition Abbey uh, with the walls around it. Uh, uh, here is a church, here is a mosque, here is a mosque, here is a mosque. This little dome right over here is the tomb of David. And right over in this area between the mosque and the tomb of David is the thing that's supposed to be the upper room. Okay. It, it may well be in this section of town. We don't know. Uh, it's, it's hard to know. Let's, uh, let's look at some pictures of stuff that fits during this last week of uh, uh, Jesus' time on earth. Uh, this is the Temple Mount in uh, Jerusalem. And that great big building in the background is the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Uh, most of the little kids that you see wandering around on the Temple Mount are Muslim, uh, but most of the uh, uh, old people with cameras are tourists. Uh, now this is a this is a, a tour I took years ago, and I'm seeing Micah Colby and some other friends in in this particular shot. Anyway, these are this is the Temple Mount. the uh, The temple would have looked substantially different from the Al-Aqsa Mosque. There's about a thousand years difference in their uh, construction times. Uh, this is the south end of the Temple Mount. Uh, the pretty lady there on the left in the flowered uh, skirt is Donna. Uh, Donna and I were both quite a bit younger when I took this picture. Those steps are called the teacher's steps. And we know that Jesus taught in this area. So you get back up onto the uh, Temple Mount itself. The Dome of the Rock today is built on roughly the site of uh, Solomon's Temple. Uh, I suspect about uh, 100 yards to the south of the correct location, uh, but scholars argue about that. Uh, that uh, the dome is not gold. It looks like it ought to be gold, but it's actually anodized aluminum. There's a, the Temple Mount from another angle. There's a little better light. Uh, you, can, uh, you can see it. Uh, that's, uh, the Dome of the Rock was built toward the end of the seventh century uh, as a way of uh, demonstrating uh, that the uh, wonderful uh, Muslim uh, uh, 
religion had taken over the world and destroyed Christianity and Judaism. Uh, and around the outside of the uh, Dome of the Rock, you'll find lots and lots of inscriptions to that effect uh, that later ended up in, uh, uh, in various forms in the Quran. Uh, uh, it's against the rules to take photographs of the interior of the Dome of the Rock, so I don't have very many. Uh, <laughs> This one, I, I probably had to purchase this as a, a set of slides in Jerusalem from, from a Muslim shop. At any rate, this is, uh, this is the interior. Uh, the stuff in here that looks like marble and uh, uh, gold leaf and that uh, really is, it's a very expensive thing. Uh, the um, materials for the construction of the Dome of the Rock came from the, uh, uh, the uh, dismantling of uh, uh, two big old churches in Jerusalem at the time, according to the uh, historians who were there. Okay, let's go off of the Temple Mount and head uh, back to the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, this is the Eastern gate to the Temple Mount viewed from Gethsemane. Now the in between that gate and the place where I'm standing is a thing called the Kidron Valley. Jesus spent quite a bit of time over here. Uh, let me give you a close up of the walls of Jerusalem. Look at the size of those stones. Uh, these, uh, uh, the stones in the Temple Mount, let's see if I can point them out, uh, are made of limestone. And you can see like this one, from the spot where I am over to the edge is about 25 feet. Uh, the longest of the stones in the Temple Mount are as much as 40 feet long. Uh, they're about uh, four by four feet. So over a, uh, almost a meter and a half square uh, by uh, 13 meters long. <coughs> the stones in the Temple Mount are, are very, very large. Uh, some of them are as much as a hundred times larger than the largest stones in uh, the temp or in the uh, pyramids of Giza in uh, in Egypt. Uh, we still don't know to this day how Herod did this, uh, but it's a it's a remarkable piece of work. Uh, here are some original stones. Uh, way down, they were way underground and they've been uncovered. These are the originals. You can see some of the reconstructed stones uh, for steps in the background, but this is teacher's steps. Uh, and this one I put in just to uh, 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 rattle Donna's cage a little bit. Uh, here we are up on a roof, uh, looking out at the uh, Dome of the Rock in the background and the Mount of Olives. And the little guy next to Donna is named Flat Stanley. Uh, there was a time when everybody who went to the grade school uh, that where Donna taught music was encouraged uh, to take Flat Stanley on a vacation. And he would go all over the world uh, and uh, uh, we'd take pictures wherever we happen to be. This is Flat Stanley in Jerusalem a few years ago. Okay. Uh, the streets of Jerusalem have always been narrow. Uh, here's, a, here's a couple of monks. Uh, this is uh, a shopping area in uh, Jerusalem. Jesus would have known streets just like this. And uh, as you can see, the, uh, the prices and uh, uh, the labels on everything here is uh, in uh, perfectly plain Arabic. So you'll have no trouble at all picking out uh, whatever that might be. I don't have any idea what most of those things are. Various kinds of nuts, I think. The shopping is a lot of fun. Okay, this is the Garden of Gethsemane. You can see that these are olive trees. Jesus and his guys apparently spent quite a bit of time uh, in this garden area. But in the midst of the garden, there are a couple of underground areas. Uh, this is a, a set of stairs that leads down into one particular area. Another one is uh, this one. This is the olive press. 
uh, inside the garden of uh, Gethsemane. The word Gethsemane itself uh, means uh, the olive press belonging to Simon. <laughs> that's, that's all it means. Uh, and uh, the garden of the olive press belonging to Simon would have been the, uh, the olive trees uh, that, that grew on the east side of the Kidron Valley at the foot of the Mount of Olives. And in the middle of that would be a gat, G-A-T, which is the olive press. There are actually several olive presses in this area. This particular cave, it's a relatively cool, um, low ceilinged natural cave, uh, has, uh, has a series of presses. An olive press is uh, uh, just a circular stone with, uh, with a channel cut in it so that uh, when uh, weights are put on top with a lever, the olives are crushed and the oil comes out. And that all took place in, in this little room here. The meeting that we see where Jesus is praying and he's talking to his disciples uh, is um, here in the cave, most likely, and not out in the garden proper, though the arrest will take place in the garden. Okay, from the arrest, we're going to end up with a, uh, uh, with, uh, a series of trials. We'll work through those, and we end up at the end of the trials with a crucifixion. Uh, and uh, this is the traditional location of the crucifixion of Christ. It's a great, awful building in uh, the old city of Jerusalem that we call the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Uh, and if I can point out here on the left where I've got Holy Sepulchre written is the, the dome that sits over the top of uh, what Roman Catholics think is the tomb of Christ. And here on the right, this particular lead dome is over the top of the place that they designate as Golgotha. Uh, there, uh, frankly, there is no evidence to support the identification of this place, uh, except for uh, some very old traditions. We can't discount old traditions. Uh, uh, so this is not necessarily the wrong place. Uh, but let me take you inside. Uh, here's the interior of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Uh, and uh, yes, this is actually what it looks like in there. It's kind of dark. Uh, it's uh, rarely kept clean. Uh, it uh, has... Um, Lots and lots of little chapels, most of which are never used anymore. Let me show you another shot here. This is called the ambulatory. Uh, and uh, there are hangings and pillars and chapels uh, all over the place. This is a group I took to Jerusalem years ago. Uh, and uh, we went down into a crypt uh, called the uh, the Crypt of the Invention of the True Cross. And I'm not making that up. Uh, this was a very long time exposure. It's about a, about a 30 second time exposure. You can see some people walking past on the left side of the picture. Uh, but this was, uh, this was shot, oh, I don't know, 30 years ago. Uh, all of that is the, uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Uh, when, uh, when Christians go to Jerusalem uh, today, I, I always tell them that they, they need to visit the traditional Church of the Holy Sepulchre. They need to go, they need to see this. Uh, I don't believe it's the right spot, but it might be. Uh, and it's also an important part of history. Uh, so we go and we, we walk through. Uh, most Christians find themselves uh, strangely unmoved by the place. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's just too foreign, it's too different. Uh, <clears throat> some Christians uh, find that they, they're attracted to the place, and that's okay too. Uh, 
I, I, I think there, there's a possibility that it could be correct. For uh, Christians who want to visualize what it may actually have looked like, uh, there is another place in Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, this is called the Garden Tomb area. Uh, this stone uh, is uh, uh, a cliff face that uh, some identify as the place of the skull or Golgotha. Uh, and if you hold your nose just right, you can kind of see a pair of eyes and a nose in the cliff face. Uh, I think it has uh, eroded quite a lot since antiquity. Uh, so I'm not sure that we're going to see eyes and nose in there, but maybe. Now, one thing you will notice is a, is a uh, city bus. Uh, the East Jerusalem or Arab bus depot has been built right at the foot of Golgotha. And you'll notice there's a cemetery on top. Let's see, here's another shot of the area. You can see all the buses, very crowded, smelly, <coughs> hot, uncomfortable place. And there on the top of it is a Muslim cemetery. Uh, now, why would there be a Muslim cemetery there? Well, that dates back to the seventh century. The Muslims knew at that time uh, that there were some Christians who believed that this was the, the place of the crucifixion. Uh, and they, they didn't want it associated with any Christian Messiah, so they, they put a cemetery on the top. Uh, and uh, then later in the modern era, about uh, 85 years ago, they built a bus depot right there, uh, just, uh, just to smell up the place. On the left side of this photograph, you can see a little balcony See this little balcony right here. That's inside this area, which is a, uh, a modern English garden. And we call this area the garden tomb. Now the tomb in the middle of that garden is this little guy right here. Uh, there are some other tombs in the garden. This is just one of them, uh, but it's interesting for a lot of reasons. You can see that the tomb is in the middle of a large garden. Lots of olive trees uh, and uh, there's other stuff that's possible. Uh, a garden requires a lot of water. This structure is a cistern. Uh, there is a cistern capacity for several uh, hundred million cubic meters of water or something like that, some large number, hundreds of thousands of cubic meters of water. Uh, you could water a garden forever from the, the water that's just available underground in the, uh, the garden tomb area. Uh, this particular tomb is in the midst of the garden. Now it's been cleared out and there's a forecourt in front of it today. But look at the structure of the thing. It's uh, built into a flat cliff face. You can see there's a, uh, a door right in the middle of this wall. It's been blocked up on one side so that the wall is clearly, or so that the door is clearly available. You'll notice something else. I'll show you this picture uh, from a different angle. There's a window in the wall. And uh, you've got to ask yourself, why does a tomb need a window? Uh, the, the, the people who are placed inside are presumably dead. Uh, so why is there a window in the, in the tomb face? Something else that you might notice just looking at this is that there is a circular pattern like an arch it's cut directly into the stone, but a circular pattern. And there are indentations in several places uh, that could be the bases for uh, beams or for the spring of a stone arch. Uh, it seems like this particular tomb may have been converted into the focus of a chapel of some sort sometime in antiquity. We don't really know the history of it, uh, but uh, we do know when we go inside 
uh, frankly, just like the tomb in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, this one is empty. Uh, this is the, originally this was a bench. It's been cut out to form a kind of casket. Uh, and again, we don't know the history of all of it. Uh, but the important thing is that this is empty. Now, outside the tomb, you would have seen this in the previous photograph, but there's a channel cut into stone. It's about, uh, about, hmm, about 15 to 20 centimeters wide. Uh, and it's about uh, 10 meters long. It's a good long channel. It's designed for a rolling stone. So there would have been a large circular stone door. Uh, the, uh, the stone that I have my hand on there uh, is the stopper at the bottom end of this channel. Uh, so when it was closed, the stone would have rolled all the way to that far end. The stone itself is about um, about four meters high, probably, in order to cover everything. So it was a great big thing. Uh, uh, people always ask when uh, we visit the garden tomb, "Where is the stone?" Where did you know it didn't just fall over? Where is that stone? And the simple answer is, we don't know. That stone is just gone. Uh, generally speaking, when we find a rolling stone tomb in Israel, <coughs> they're fairly common, especially in the Judean hill country. The stone is still in place and grave robbers have uh, levered it far enough to one side that they can sneak past and steal stuff from the tomb. This tomb hasn't been robbed. Uh, the, the stone was completely uh, taken out of the way. Um, now, how did that happen? Is it possible that the angels just vaporized that rock? That could be. Some have suggested that the resurrection itself caused so much energy release that the stone was removed. I'm fine with that. Um, the correct answer is we don't know. That stone is gone and the tomb is empty. Now let's look at the front of that tomb one more time. You can see the, the height of the door. It's about man height. Uh, there's a window. Now, what are we doing with a window in the tomb? Uh, it's interesting that that particular window is in exactly the right place that at the spring equinox, about Easter time every year, at sunrise, the light from the sun at dawn pokes right through that window and lights up the empty burial shelf in the tomb. It seems like that's on purpose. Uh, now, again, we don't know. That could be a complete accident. Maybe some stones fell down uh, and they just happened to be there. Uh, but I rather don't think so. If you look at the face of that tomb, and we're not going to, you'll find uh, a cross, several crosses incised into the stone. If you look at the larger forecourt area, uh, you'll see an indentation in the stone here, kind of an oval area with a long channel cut this way, out away from the forecourt. Now, what could that possibly be for? Well, some have said, well, it must be a wine press. And I thought, okay, the wine press in a garden, that it sort of almost makes sense, but what else could it be? Well, the other thing that it could be is a baptistry. Uh, it's entirely possible that this little tomb was the focal point of an early Christian chapel during the first century or two after the time of Christ. It's possible. Uh, so there's a good argument that this is the right place. Uh, nothing is ever perfect in these things. Uh, certainly it's easier to visualize uh, than the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. So I bring people to the garden tomb.
Okay, uh, this is the Mount of Olives taken from uh, Jerusalem. We're looking across uh, the uh, Temple Mount area, across the Jewish cemetery that's on, on the uh, uh, Mount of Olives. Uh, and off on the left side at the top of that hill is the Russian Church of the Ascension. And then this is another picture. This is a goodbye picture from Jerusalem, uh, this time without Flat Stanley. Uh, and there in the background, the Mount of Olives. That's the spot where Jesus ascended into heaven. So there's a, a variety of churches up there uh, and uh, it's an important spot. Okay, let's, uh, let's be done with uh, that. Let's see if I can get out of that. Ooh, it worked, amazing. Okay, uh, we've got a, a seizure by the temple police. I think temple police more likely than Roman soldiers. Uh, although uh, some have argued for Roman soldiers, I don't think so. I think uh, uh, the temple security guys uh, would have grabbed Jesus. Uh, it was Peter who took a swipe at uh, one of uh, the uh, uh, one of the policemen. That's always a bad idea. Uh, if if a policeman wants to arrest you. Uh, you, you know, let him do that, uh, and you, you, can, you can argue about it later. Oh, it's almost always a bad idea. Uh, uh, Jesus put the ear back on uh, after, uh, Peter was probably trying to cut the guy's head off and he missed. Uh, I, I love Peter, but you know, Peter is Peter. Uh, and he took a swipe, missed, Jesus said, oh, Peter, would you just put your sword away? <laughs> You know, let me fix that for you. And he fixed the guy's ear and uh, allowed himself to be arrested. He went for trial before the high priest Caiaphas, which is not a present, uh, pleasant time. Uh, Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin met in the middle of the night to condemn Jesus. Uh, and uh, it was during this time that Peter denied Jesus three times. Uh, he was warming himself outside and uh, said, you were uh, a servant girl came up and said, you were with Jesus. And he denied it. Uh, and, uh, somebody else said, well, this man was with Jesus. Uh, and uh, again, he denied it. I said, I don't know him. And after a little while, some bystanders said, surely you were one of them. Your accent betrays you. And he, he invoked a curse on himself and said, I don't know him. And immediately the rooster crowed. Uh, Peter remembered. Chapter 27, we see the, uh, the trial uh, before Pilate. Uh, Pilate is uh, the Roman governor of uh, Judea. Uh, I should have a, uh, a photograph of the, uh, the Pilate stone that we found in uh, Caesarea Philippi. I'll do that for one of the later uh, gospels. Uh, Pontius Pilate was uh, a famous guy, famous villain. Actually, the, the badness of uh, a pilot is not so much that he crucified Jesus, although he should probably not have done that, as that he was a weak politician. Uh, he, he bent to the pressure of the mob. Uh, that's, that's always a cowardly thing to do. Uh, you've got the, the biggest mob raising the biggest ruckus and looting and burning and causing trouble. Doing what they want is really not a brave thing to do. And uh, uh, Pilate didn't want a riot, uh, so he decided the easy way, crucify Jesus. Along the way, Judas hanged himself. Uh, 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 in uh, uh, Luke's gospel, it says his, uh, his bowels came out. Uh, so what exactly happened? Well, he hanged himself, and after a while, nature took its course. Uh, uh, Jesus before Pilate is uh, a famous uh, uh, confrontation. Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, you've said so. Uh, and uh, they're all, uh, the Jews are all angry. Uh, the governor was accustomed to release somebody. He says, uh, here you go, I've got, uh, I've got Jesus, your king. And uh, instead the crowd demanded 
uh, a thief by the name of Barabbas who was delivered. Uh, the uh, next section, Pilate delivers Jesus to be crucified. Uh, in uh, verse uh, 24, the end of 24, he says, I'm innocent of this man's blood. And he released Barabbas. And all the people answered, his blood be on us and our children. And Jesus was delivered up to be crucified. This would have been done by Roman soldiers. Uh, the, uh, the Jews didn't have the authority to crucify anybody. It was done by Romans. So the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters. They gathered the battalion. They stripped him, put a scarlet robe on him and mocked him. Uh, it was a bad thing to do. Uh, they took him out, forced him to carry his own cross piece for the cross. Uh, and uh, he couldn't do it. He stumbled. And so the cross was given to Simon, who was a man from Cyrene. Uh, they took him finally to a place called Golgotha and offered him wine to drink. And he tasted it. And uh, uh, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. They sat down and over his head, they put the charge against him. This is Jesus, King of the Jews. And he was crucified with two robbers, one on either side. Those who passed by uh, mocked him uh, saying, you would destroy the temple. Now you can't even get yourself down. So this was bad. Uh, at the sixth hour, Verse 45, there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour. The sixth hour is uh, just about dawn. The ninth hour uh, is, uh, uh, well, no, let's see, sixth hour, ninth hour. No, I've forgotten. Sixth hour is about noon, ninth hour is about three in the afternoon. So from the sixth hour, there was darkness over the land till the ninth. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, uh, which is uh, Aramaic, uh, and it means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, yeah, the, the issue of Jesus' forsakenness on the cross is really interesting. We're not going to get into it because I want to finish the resurrection today, but the idea of God forsaking Jesus on the cross and what that means uh, is a bit of a mystery. Uh, it's uh, not something that, it, uh, I can't just give you an answer and say, well, this is easy. Uh, it just means that God walked away from him. Well, that, how, how do you do that if Jesus is God? So there's a, there's a difficulty there. There's a mystery there. In some sense, Jesus is forsaken on the cross. And some bystanders uh, heard it and they didn't understand. Uh, verse uh, 50, Jesus cried out with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. In John, we're actually going to hear seven last words from the cross. Uh, and uh, they were uh, uh, at this moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two, the earth shook, the tombs were open. Whoa. And the centurion, remember about centurions. The centurion is a is a non-commissioned officer, kind of a sergeant, and he was in charge of the squad that was crucifying Jesus. Uh, so the sergeant looks up uh, and uh, saw the earthquakes and the rest of it and said, truly, this was the son of God. Now, the sergeant might not have known what he was actually talking about. Uh, he might have uh, said, well, surely this is a son of a God. Uh, but he was more correct than he knew. Truly, this was the Son of God. Uh, there were also many women here looking on from a distance, among them Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Now, which particular Marys? Uh, it's uh, uh, traditional to include uh, 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 Jesus' mom in this group. That would be the mother of James and Joseph. 
Uh, the problem is James and Joseph are very, very common names, and it would have been handy to say the mother of Jesus here. Um, on the other hand, in the Gospel of John, we've got uh, uh, Mary, mother of Jesus, there. So this is probably Mary, the mother of Jesus. Uh, after this, uh, Jesus is buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, no, that's what we see there. A guard was placed at the tomb. There's some argument about whether uh, the guard was actually Roman soldiers or was uh, a Jewish temple uh, security police. Uh, it, it actually makes a certain amount of difference because of the discipline involved. Uh, I, I think it's Roman soldiers. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we've got uh, some kind of a guard, a good, well-disciplined guard. Uh, and uh, uh, Pilate said, um, here's, here's your guard. You have your guard. Uh, go make it as secure as you can. And that takes us to chapter 28. We go through this every Easter. The empty tomb. This is ultimately the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the single most important event in all of history. That's the most important thing that ever happened. Uh, and uh, because of that, I've got uh, a couple of slides uh, that I want to walk through uh, because uh, so much is going on here. The emptiness of the tomb is given to us in the first eight verses. His first personal experience or appearance is given to the women who came to the tomb in verses 9 and 10. Uh, the Jews came up with a, an official explanation in uh, verses 11 to 15. Oh, uh, uh, you, uh, we'll take care of you uh, soldiers. Uh, we, won't, we won't have you killed uh, if you spread the rumor that his disciples came and stole the body. Because uh, that'll that'll fix them. If you just tell a big enough lie, it can cover up the uh, the previous corruption, uh, and have, it's not going to work. Uh, the resurrection is way too big a deal. Uh, and then we finally come down to the Great Commission at uh, at the end of the whole story. Let's look at uh, the first little bit here. Uh, after the Sabbath, toward dawn on the first day of the week. Now, the first day of the week has to be Sunday. Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, Passover meal had to have happened on Thursday evening, uh, leading up toward the Sabbath, which is Saturday. Uh, it doesn't quite add up to uh, three times 24, 72 hours in the tomb, uh, but it includes parts of three days. Uh, and scholars continue to, uh, to argue, but it doesn't matter. After the Sabbath, so therefore, on the first day of the week and at dawn, the reason that most of us try to go to church on Sunday mornings is to celebrate the resurrection. We call it the Lord's Day. The Sabbath is Saturday uh, from Sundown Friday until sundown Saturday is the Sabbath day. And we should never argue about that. Nobody has changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. The Sabbath is still Saturday. And the Sabbath was never intended to be a religious obligation for anybody. It's supposed to be a good thing. Jesus said the Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Anyway, all of that aside, we meet together for church to celebrate the resurrection. And there at dawn, the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, who is not Mary, the mother of Jesus, went to see the tomb. And behold, there was an earthquake for an angel descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. Okay, there's what happened to the stone. He rolled it out of the way and sat on it. And so at the time of Christ, we're told there was an angel sitting on that stone. Now, what happened to it afterwards? I don't know. Vaporized, 
cut up into little parts and made into bricks. We don't know what happened to that stone. Uh, and an angel sat on it. Now, in the uh, Gospel of Luke, we're told there were two angels. Uh, apparently, Matthew only thought it was important to mention the one who was big enough to roll the stone and talk to Mary. So the appearance of this angel was like lightning, his clothes white as snow, and the fear of him, the guards trembled, became like dead men. And the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Okay, I want you to, to see something that's really important here. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. I want you to understand some things here that are very important. One, Jesus predicted that he would be resurrected. He said, guys, we're heading for Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer. They're going to kill me. But on the third day, I'll be resurrected. I'll rise again. The disciples didn't understand that what Jesus was promising would be literally fulfilled. I want you to understand this is so important. When God makes promises, he fulfills those promises just as he said. And so God spoke to Abram and Sarah and said, I'll be back in a year and you'll have a child, name him Isaac. And so God came to Sarah, just as he said, and she became pregnant, just as God had promised. And they named his uh, name Isaac, just as God had commanded. It was literally fulfilled. The resurrection literally happened just as he said. When God makes promises, he always does precisely what he promises he will do. The disciples didn't understand it. They thought, oh, he'll live on forever in our hearts or something like that. And it was difficult for them later in this very chapter to grasp the notion that Jesus is alive. The angel said, come and look at the place where he lay. Then go quickly, tell his disciples he has risen from the dead, and behold, he's going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. When God says it, it's true. And he intends to follow through on that. Okay. Uh, and uh, I don't have the, oh, I should uh, mention this. Uh, and so they departed quickly from the tomb. This is verses, verse eight and nine. Uh, with, with fear and great joy, they ran to tell the disciples and behold, Jesus met them. What a deal. Uh, I, I find it fascinating. Jesus appeared to the women first. Uh, I think because they, they were faithful. They showed up. I, I think if, if uh, Peter and some of the others had come to take care of the, of the tomb, uh, that Jesus would have appeared to them. Uh, but they had other things to do. They were busy being, uh, being popes or whatever they were working on. Uh, and it was the women who came to take care of the stuff that needs to be taken care of. Uh, and they're the ones who saw him first. And behold, Jesus met them and he said, greetings. They came up, took hold of his feet and worshiped him. And Jesus said, don't be afraid. Go and tell my brothers, go to Galilee. There they will see me. And the guard lied, tell people his disciples claimed. Now, verse 18. And Jesus came to them. This is in authority in, uh, uh, in uh, Galilee again. And you notice the, the photograph I've got here. I've, I've, this, I've forgotten where this picture was taken. This is in the Philippines. <laughs> I don't know if that's, uh, that's Paul or Oscar in the Philippines at any rate. 
uh, he, Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Uh, which is a very, very important line. How much authority do you need? Go, therefore, make disciples of the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So Jesus starts out by saying, I've got all authority in heaven and earth. Uh, God has declared me his son with whom he is well pleased. Uh, and I, I, I have all of God's authority. So here are my orders. Uh, this is uh, like the centurion says, I too am a man under authority. And I say to one, go, and he goes to another, come, and he comes. So I know you can do whatever you want. You've got authority. Jesus has all authority in heaven and earth. Go. Uh, technically, the, uh, uh, the finite verb in this sentence is make disciples. Uh, and uh, the word go there is actually a participle. We could translate it uh, while you're going or since you're up anyway, as long as you're going, therefore, make disciples of the nations. Our job, the reason we continue to exist on the planet, the reason God didn't just translate us directly out of our bodies straight into heaven when we accepted Christ is that our job is to spend a lifetime making disciples uh, of everyone that we have access to. And Jesus assumes that we will go for whatever reason. Maybe we will go to get jobs. Maybe we will go because of earthquakes. Maybe we will go on vacation, but whatever, we will end up going, we will fill the earth, and while we're up, we must make disciples of everyone we come in contact with. That's our fundamental job. Uh, a, uh, a friend came to my church many, many, many years ago and preached a sermon uh, in a church I was pastoring in which he said, the mission of the church is missions. Uh, what, what are we supposed to be doing? We're supposed to be making disciples of the nations. That's the one command Jesus gives us. Okay, love each other, uh, you know, put together the fruit of the spirit. Yeah, all of that. But the command, make disciples of the nations, baptizing them because you've led them to Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. This is the Trinity. Later on, we're going to see the church struggling manfully to come up with words that can explain how God, who is one, can be three. And it's so difficult for them, just as I find it is difficult for all of my students today. They say, how, how is this even possible? Well, it's a very great mystery for us. <laughs> God is Father, God is Son, God is Holy Spirit. He is one God in three persons. Jesus just assumed we would accept that because everything he says is true. Having baptized them, teach them to observe all that I've commanded you. By observe, we mean to study carefully and then put into practice all that we know to be true. These are my commands. I've commanded you. And behold, Jesus says to his disciples as they prepare to go out into the world, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's another promise. That is another promise. When Jesus gives promises, he never 
fulfills those in some kind of a mythical, magical, spiritual way. When we go out into the world to make disciples, Jesus is there with us. And we don't mean just in a figurative sort of way in our hearts and minds. He is literally there with us. We are the body of Christ. We go to make Jesus physically present in the world. That's the point of the church. This is a powerful message. And here we are together. Uh, I, uh, frankly, I, uh, I cherish our time together. For at this moment, here I am sitting in Idaho in a snowstorm, I'm looking out the window. And some of you are listening from the Philippines, where you have gone to make disciples of the nations. Some of you are listening to me from churches in Italy, where God has sent you deliberately to make disciples of the nations. We're all in this together. And when I say all, I mean all of us listening and Jesus who is amongst us. This, this, is our, this is our thing. This is what we're here for. We're not here to make a lot of money. We're not here to get famous. We're not here to get powerful. We're here to make disciples of the nations. Uh, and uh, the rest of it is window dressing. And sometimes the rest of it works just fine. And sometimes it works out tragically, but our job has never changed. Okay, I'm going to stop the share and say bye-bye. <laughs> that ends the, uh, uh, the Gospel of Matthew. I, uh, honestly, I love the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, I, uh, I am not going to spend quite as much time with uh, uh, Mark and Luke as I did with uh, with Matthew. Uh, Matthew lays out the, the the basics. All of the structure is there, and we'll uh, we'll look at how it differs uh, in uh, the other two synoptic gospels. Then we'll spread out again in the Gospel of John. We'll take actually more time in John than we spent in uh, in Matthew. But I will see you again on Wednesday, and at that time there'll be a new set of notes. And we'll go on into the gospel of Mark. God bless you all. And uh, we'll, we'll see you all again on Wednesday. We love you guys. Looking forward to seeing you in Italy and the Philippines, both. Blessings. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Dr. John. Thank you, Dr. John. Love you guys. Bye-bye. <laughs>